Hey, Kev, let's let's follow this trail over here. This looks like there might be something waiting down there. All right. Hey, wait a minute. Do you hear that? Yeah, I thought it was just me. What the heck is that? I don't know what that is. Whoa, do you smell that, too? That's unbelievable. Hey, look. What the? Hey, look, those, those branches are moving over there. What the heck is that? Holy cow, is that what I think it is? Look at that thing. It, oh my god. It's a freaking Sasquatch. Welcome to the Bigfoot Terror in the Woods Sightings and Encounters podcast. I am your host, W.J. Sheehan. Hello, everybody, and may I welcome you and yours once again to our show. My name is W.J. Sheehan, author of the series of books, Bigfoot Terror in the Woods, Sightings and Encounters, nine volumes available in paperback and ebook at Amazon, and in audio format, volumes one through eight and soon to be nine at Audible iTunes and Amazon as well. And now, may I introduce you to my flesh brother and co-host, KJ Sheehan. Kev, how are you? I'm doing great. How about you, Bill? Pretty, pretty, pretty good. It was a beautiful... This is Sunday, folks. We're recording this on a Sunday. It was a great day, Kev. Great day. Did you have nice weather up there in New York? Uh, so-so, 40s, okay. you know, typical January for the region. Our our uh, mainstay this month of the year is 40s during the day, and that's where we are right now. Yeah, today we had, uh, down here in North Carolina, it was 37 and raining. So yeah. It was, it was chill at a bite, uh, bite to your bone, you know. Yeah, the raw cold with the water. Oh, mm. yeah. That that is uh, that's what tips the cart, boy. The water, exactly, and of course, <laughs> dark and gray all day. You know, yeah. Well, it's dark and gray, like some of our uh, stories yes. in our podcasts. Yes, a little dark and gray <laughs> and gloomy, <laughs> with black eyes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was talking to my friend Mike, nurse practitioner Mike. I know you're listening, Miguel. And uh, he was getting involved in some sort of U.S. UFO attraction project uh, this weekend. <laughs> what, is that, what does that mean? You're trying to attract UFOs? Yeah, he had something up his sleeve. He was getting involved in some worldwide attraction project. And uh, everybody had uh, a part to play. Uh, and he was inviting me, and I says, Mike, you can leave me out of that thing because <laughs> you don't know what you're inviting into your neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> Were they using a Ouija board? Yeah, well, it's, uh, you know, here's the thing, folks, and you can say what you will, and I know you will. I'm voicing my opinion. The laws of attraction, which are used scientifically, uh, to solve many problems, also have the same effect no matter what it is you're trying to attract. There are laws that are in play, like gravity, like playing with a plant chart on a Ouija board, mm. like going down to Shinnecock and trying to lure in some UFOs. <laughs> There's all kinds of things that can be attracted in different ways to different people. I mean, are they whistling for them and skipping stones? or? Yeah, I'm not sure what he was doing, but I don't care if you're whistling Dixie or uh, drinking a six-pack and smoking a Macanudo. Uh, you better be careful. Because uh, you may not like what presents itself to you. Mm, that could go for a Macanudo now that you mention it. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. A mac and noodles okay as long as there's no hitchhikers attached to it. No, no. You know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so well, anyways, you have to let me know how that works out for Mike. Well, I don't know. Mike, if you're listening, I'm uh, expecting a field report from you. Exactly. And Especially if, he's not, if you get picked up by a UFO yeah. and go for a little ride, we'll put you on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if he doesn't answer me, he may be no more. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, brother, what do we have for our history, uh, history in the news, cryptids in the news, and other oddities segment? Yeah, you're throwing me off with the history lesson. <laughs> That's a different podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, well Bill, on. I figured it was pretty chilly around the continental U.S. lately. Uh-huh. So it might be a good time to go to Hawaii to get no. the creep on. <laughs> Don't kid in Hawaii, huh? Hawaii, yeah. We're going to talk about the legend of the Hawaiian night marchers. Oh, boy. Yeah. It, do- it doesn't sound good. Night marchers <laughs> sound scary? <laughs> Maybe. Freaking night marchers. <laughs> it might get a little worse, let me warn you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Here we go. But Ding. it's uh, pretty cool, and uh, a lot of the information I'm going to talk about here comes from our friends at How Stuff Works. So uh, they did some pieces on... The Hawaiian night marchers, as well as the local newspapers Uh in Oahu, where a lot of this takes place, which is, you know, the the little island of Oahu where uh, Pearl Harbor is and Waikiki, the old Hawaii Five-O scenes there with Diamond Head in the background. Book him, Dano. Exactly. Good old Jack Lord. <laughs> um, so in Hawaii, when you get what we call goosebumps, typically here in the U.S. or in the continental U.S., they call it chicken skin. So like when you get the prickly bumps and the hair raising sensation. Uh-huh. Um, and so they call it chicken skin. And uh, when you run into the presence of these Hawaiian night marchers, they talk about the fact that you will definitely experience some chicken skin. <laughs> How about feathers? <laughs> No, uh, no feathers. So we're going to talk about where these things come from, like what they're believed to be about. But first, we're going to talk about and we'll talk about what they look like. But first, we're going to talk about the fact that typically before you ever see the night marchers, you're going to hear them. So they are marchers, so they come walking along these spirits. They are not earthly beings. Uh, They were likely from the earth at one point, but now uh, uh, creepy spirits of a sort. And the first thing most people experience when they come in contact with them is this ominous, deep thudding of the ancient war drums. Oh. Yes, and then as they get closer, you'll hear some guttural chanting. Hmm. And if that's not enough for you, you know, these thudding war drums and guttural chanting, you'll hear some spine-tingling blasts from a conch shell. Wow. Hmm. So these are former warriors of the island chain, no doubt. We're going to get there. We're going right. to get there. Okay. And But one thing that's really interesting, well, there's a lot of things that's really interesting about these folks, critters, um, but they have something in common with our Bigfoot friends. Oh, really? Yeah. What <laughs> else we, do you think you might experience as they get closer? I have no doubt. Red eyes. No, no, no. This is what you would experience. Like one of your senses. Oh, the sense of uh, fear. No, the stank. Really? The stench of death might assault your nose. Good guesses on your part. But I was going for stank. <laughs> and more specifically, stench of death, or as our the late Alex Trebek would say, "What is a stench of death?" 
Correct. You have five thousand dollars. <laughs> Excellent. I'll trade that for an autographed copy of the book. And then, so so you hear them. Uh, you hear the drums. You hear the chanting. You hear the conch shell. You start to smell death. Ugh. And then you will start to see a succession of torches, flaming torches, winding towards you in the darkness. Oh, man, I think it's time to go. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean, man? I wish I had those little drums again, Kev. Yeah, when the legs start booking. Rumph! <laughs> 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 yeah, those aren't the drums that the death marches carry. No, 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 no. No, or night marchers, I should say. Uh. So apparently they're known throughout the Hawaiian uh, islands um, and known for many generations. And, you know, one of the folks that they interviewed uh, in this article, who's a uh, Hawaiian priest, um, he said that it's basically ingrained in the Hawaiian culture that these night marchers are out there. Hmm. Uh, and what, is it, what did he mean by that? Did he get into that? He just meant that, like, everybody knows about them. Oh, they don't okay. all talk about them, but, you know, you're not going to find somebody that's a native Hawaiian that doesn't know about the night marchers, and then a lot of folks have run into them as well. Wow. And we'll talk about that. So, you know, some of the theories about this is that, you know, in, in uh, you know, the, the ancient times, a lot of these high-ranking chiefs in the islands there were so sacred that no mortal man or woman were allowed to look at them. Hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then also, no one could be clothed in their presence. So if they were coming, you were to, like, basically remove your clothes. Of course, there weren't a lot of clothes back then anyway, especially in the Hawaiian Islands. And um, and definitely don't look at them. Like, turn around or lay down on your face and don't look up, right? Mm-hmm. And then innocent bystanders who would stumble upon this procession, like when these uh, royal folks were moving around from place to place, they, and if they didn't know... The, the rules or they didn't see them coming and then saw them and looked at them and had their clothes on, they would be killed. Oh, boy. Right. Immediately. Like, no <laughs> what kind of asked. death are we talking about? Uh, you know, they talk about a bloodbath. So I'm thinking it's like spears and uh, some type of uh, bamboo sword or something, but they don't talk about it. But that's what I'm thinking of. Not like a predator jumping out of a tree limb and just doing you in. No, no. More mm. brutal. To make an example of you for not <laughs> respecting the, uh, the uh, royalty. You know, they don't call it royalty, but basically you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Right. Unbelievable. Um, so, so they do talk about, it's interesting, that some of the more kindly nobles uh, took to traveling at night in order to avoid being spotted by commoners, right? So, like, if you were one of the nicer noble folks and didn't have a screw loose upstairs and liked to see bloodbath, you might say to your troop, hey, you know, let's travel at night just so that we're less likely to stumble upon anyone. Mm -hmm. And um, so that tradition of traveling at night is carried on in the afterlife, so mm-hmm. this is the night marchers are doing this march at night when people come across them because they don't come across them in the daytime because mm-hmm. they would be the ones that would often march from place to place in the dark. Hmm. So pretty interesting, right? Like it comes comes across with them. Yeah, but it almost seems kind of odd that if you were in a position of authority uh, to travel at night uh, might leave you open for an attack from, say, like something like a coup. Yeah, of course. But remember, there's nobody. You know, you're you're right, Bill. That could happen, but it could also be safer because everybody's sleeping. <laughs> right? I mean, seriously, if no one knew your plan, <laughs> yeah, you know. But if somebody <laughs> knew your plan, yeah, it'd be easier to ambush you. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one of the big questions we always ask with the hairy man is how do we see one of these? And, you know, when, in fact, do they come out? So 
it turns out that um, they're tied off. They believe that they're tied to the cycle of the moon. Hmm. So they tend to appear mostly during the last four phases of the moon in Hawaii. So as the moon wanes to blackness, they seem to prefer to come out then, and they come to sacred sites and notable cultural spots. And again, mostly on the island of Oahu, but not exclusively on the island of Oahu. And nobody makes any ties uh, between them and Oahu? Not not the place itself, no. Okay. okay. But I also think, Bill, as I was reading, you know, these different articles and sources about this, mm-hmm. is that I think maybe, you know, Oahu's the most populated island. So it could be that they're seen more there or most often there because there's people there to see them. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of the islands are pretty rural, especially outside of the resorts. Yeah. You know, yeah. like you're you're on uh, like Oahu uh, and Waikiki, like where, you know, the old uh, Hawaii Five-O was filmed looking down the beach at Diamond Head, that old mm-hmm. dormant volcano. I mean, that's like Manhattan to me on uh, the Pacific Ocean. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's a big city. I don't know what mm-hmm. the population is, but I've probably been there about 10 times. Mostly for work, and it's it's a really busy city. Yeah, no doubt about it. I knew a fellow that had a piece of property on uh, Molokai. Okay, yeah, and uh, he was living over there like uh, Robinson Crusoe. Yeah, Molokai is one of the pretty rural islands, mm-hmm. from my understanding. I've never been over there. I heard it's a good place to hang out if you're a wild boar. Yeah. <laughs> You're talking about somebody who's not good at parties? <laughs> not that kind of bore. Oh, I'm sorry. I was thinking the one with tusks. Oh. But good guess, good guess. Well, if you had tusks, you might not do well at parties either. That is you know? correct, especially if you stunk <laughs> like a bore, too. People might not care what you have to talk about, no matter how interesting it is. If you stink and you have huge tusks. That's it, man. It's the (laughs) freaking stank. Unless you're out looking for UFOs, you might enjoy running into (laughs) something that stinks with huge tusks. So, you know, we talked about where, when and where you might see them. But the folks, you know, in these articles definitely clearly mention, the Hawaiians mention, it's dangerous to seek out the marchers if that's not... uh, you know, obvious, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and and most folks, you know, most of the locals understand that and they take it very seriously. They also mention that you, when you're walking around at night, this is interesting, Bill, you don't want to be whistling because some say that the whistling might actually summon night marchers. Hmm. So Anything? I got to remember that next time I'm walking down the uh, ocean front <laughs> back to my hotel in Waikiki and I might be whistling the theme from Hawaii 50 or something. <laughs> Stop whistling for goodness sakes. Oh, oh, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say any particular songs they don't like. No, yeah, just the whistling might attract them. So they may like it very much. It's not Shh. Show tunes from the 30s and 40s, perhaps? <laughs> you say tomato and I and say, I say tomato. tomato. They probably like that. <laughs> well, Fitzgerald. So, so this, this part coming up here is also super interesting. So apparently these night marchers, if you come across them, because they are kind of the spirits of ancient leaders, they actually respect bloodlines. So, you know, some of the experiences say that you you could be extremely fortunate that one of the long dead uh, men or spirits of men will will recognize you as a distant ancestor. Huh. Yeah. And come over and introduce themselves no, to you. No, they actually shout. Uh, it's uh, N-A uh, with an accent and then a U. So like, nah, you, which to me, when I first read it was like, Hey, not you, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it actually means mine apparently in Hawaii. No. So, so, you know, that one of the warriors has recognized you as a descendant of theirs. Hmm. And I would imagine that would, uh, <coughs> excuse me, not be uncommon 
Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Somewhere in the bloodline, if you're a native, you're probably yeah. related to some of these. Now, yeah. I don't know how common it is that they actually recognize you as a descendant. Now, so, so it's pretty interesting. They say, now, if you don't share blood with any of the warriors, you'll be left with only a few choices. Hmm. As legend goes, you must strip off all your clothing immediately and lay face down on the ground and close your eyes and play dead. And you're going to laugh at this next part. For good measure, urinate uncontrollably. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the idea is to convince the night marchers that you have nothing but fear with respect to their presence. Wow. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm writing yeah, this down. Yeah. I'm going to have to put it in my travel notebook. <laughs> yeah. Make I sure you... I, I guess I should drink a lot of water, <laughs> yeah. too, when I'm going out for a walk. Yeah. <laughs> and don't wear many nice clothes. Yeah. You know. So this, this gentleman that they interviewed says that he once personally encountered the night marchers. Mm-hmm. And he says that he was in a Chinese cemetery on the island one night, and he was leading a ghost tour. Mm, nice. So, like you were talking about looking for UFOs, Bill. Mm-hmm. Be, be careful of stones that you turn over. Mm-hmm. And he says that entire cemetery is built over a night marcher's trail. And aye, aye. unbeknownst to him, he just happened to be standing in the middle of their path. No kidding. Yeah, and he said their effect on him was immediate and overwhelming. Huh. He said it was like being encapsulated in a bubble. The sound was gone. He said, I could see the wind moving in the trees around me, and I could see the tall grass blowing, but I couldn't hear or feel anything. Mm -hmm. And he said, and then immediately he became extremely hot. Hmm. And he said later, after the event, he'd learned from a cousin that ancestors would likely have recognized him and surrounded him to provide protection from the other marchers. Mm. Well, that's one thought. (laughs) What do you think? Uh, I mean, we just got done talking about it. Be careful what you wish for. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're in a graveyard ghost hunting and now they're already, uh, the envelope is open. And they're ghost hunting, not only ghosts, Chinese ghosts. Yeah. you know, uh, That's even man. creepier. You see, and Kev, <laughs> it's not that I don't believe these people. I believe they experienced Oh, this. yeah, it's just a question of what was it they actually right. experienced. Right, and for what reason. Oh, yeah. You know. Oh, I get it. I know where you're going. Yep. Unbelievable, man. So, you know, even though, you know, they wrap up a lot of the articles by saying, even though we tell you what to do when you see it, the best thing to do is just run like crazy. Yeah. Which is kind of, uh, yeah, I think that's what I'd be doing, too. (laughs) Yeah. You might even be urinating while you're running like crazy. Well, yeah, just for good measure. (laughs) 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 And you might even hear some of those Scooby-Doo drums. Freaking night marches. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> ay, 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 ay. Really, I, I mean, there's no end to it. No. There is a constant flow, uh, ebb and flow of uh, high strangeness around the planet. Uh, and here we are in the Hawaiian Islands, you know, uh, there's other stuff I've heard of uh, relative to the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, we'll probably run across it on another day and another gig that we do. Sure. But uh, there's a lot of weird stuff going on around there. Just you make know? sure you tell me about it before I go next time. Yeah. <laughs> nah, nah. You know, by the way, they don't, what was the guy's name again from Hawaii Five O, Kev? Jack Lord. Yeah, Jack. They don't make fake cops like Jack Lord anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. He had that slick kind of fifties DA I was haircut say he had that with the cool vi- hair, man. Yeah, with the Vitalis. You know, I mean, it's not as cool as my hair, for example, <laughs> which is non-existent. Oh wow. 
It's a podcast. You don't have to tell everyone. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I always like those hairdos that don't move no matter oh, yeah. what Even happens. Even on the coast of Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, he could go out on a surfboard. He's out on the surfboard <laughs> on the bonsai <laughs> pipeline. Get dunked and he comes out and he's yeah. got perfect hair. <laughs> Gives it a shake and it's just like that. <laughs> yeah. Da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bill. So that's cryptids in the news and other oddities. And folks out there, hopefully if you're in a really cold place like South Dakota, you know, just thinking about Hawaii, even with these creepy marchers, just warmed you up a little bit. Yeah. Well, thanks for the warming trend. <laughs> and if you don't mind, I'm going to throw a log on the fire. <laughs> because what I'm about to read to you is frankly unbelievable. And let me get right down to it. This brief yet chilling encounter was told to me by Paige Saunders, who at the time was a resident of the state of Missouri. Here is what Paige found herself confronted with in April of 1995. In September of 1995, I had what I will describe as my first scare. If you would allow me to explain, I will. I was living alone in a house in Dexter at the time that had a rear yard backed up against the woods. And beyond the woods was a swamp of sorts. My kitchen at the time had what I will describe as a three-panel door, which led out onto my patio. This door consisted of the main operating door in the middle, which was flanked by two full-length operating casements. These could be swung open for ventilation and if I was burning my food, which was something I was fairly good at yeah, in say, those it sounds days. Sounds like that's not a rarity. Right, a little humor there on the part of Paige. <laughs> the floor in the kitchen was made of real brick, so that it made absolutely no noise when walking on it with soft shoe bottoms or bare feet. Attached to the door, as well as these two side lights, were full-length operational blinds. And when they were drawn, I couldn't see out, and you could not see in. I will also mention, as I get going with this, that then, as well as now, I keep a 357 Magnum in my house at all times, for comfort and safety, if you catch my drift. <laughs> That's a woman after my own heart. <coughs> now, the doorknob on this back door was a little wobbly, but it was still functional. And it made a kind of rattling sound when you grabbed it. This was a sound that I was more than a little familiar with having lived in the house for seven years with it making this noise. It was on a Friday night. I was alone watching TV. When I was certain that I heard the doorknob rattle, I tiptoed into the bedroom and grabbed my gun and slowly made my way over to the back door, where I grabbed the blinds and pulled them up quickly, and nothing was there. I swear to you that if anything or anyone had been standing there, they would have died, and I'm not fooling. It was then in late October when I was reading a book again at night, that I heard the doorknob rattle once again. 
And just like the last time, I went and got my gun, snuck over to the door and pulled the blinds open quickly. And yet again, nothing was there. This time, I called the police. When the police arrived, I told them what had happened in September and now in October. And I stated emphatically that there was a prowler around. I even grabbed the doorknob and rattled it to reproduce this very distinct sound that it made. He said, the officer that it could have been the wind or any number of other things, even though I had said there was no wind, which was completely true. He then said to me that living alone, we can imagine many things in a house of this size. Mind you, my house was an 800-square-foot ranch. (laughs) So I don't know what he was talking about. It's a giant house. Yeah. If you at, were any, a mouse. <laughs> at any rate, he left, and I said to myself, good riddance. As I fast forward in my story to April of the following year, nothing else had transpired as far as hearing the doorknob rattle. It was yet again on a Friday night that I had a couple of my girlfriends over for some wine and cheese. The girls left around 11 p.m., and I was so wound up that at 2 a.m. I was still awake, when suddenly the doorknob started to rattle, Mm -hmm. but in a much more forceful manner than before. So hard was this rattle that I was sure it would break off, and so this time I ran into the bedroom to get my revolver. I was As I was making my way to the door, it was still rattling and my heart was now pounding. This time, I actually tore the blinds down with my pistol pointing right at the glass. And at first, all I saw was black. It took me but a heartbeat to realize that I should be looking at my patio furniture and not anything black. And my eyes immediately looked up when, to my horror, I was face to face with a monster whose head was leaning down under my rain gutter. I pulled the trigger, blowing out the glass and moldings, hitting this bastard from hell square in the abdomen. And I followed it with bullet number two and three as it was turning. I had hit it full on with three 357 rounds and it didn't fall. As I flung the door open, it was halfway across my backyard heading for the woods and I pumped the last two right into it. I was certain that every round had hit its mark. You'll have to take my word for it. I could shoot a smiley face on a piece of paper at a hundred feet with my handgun. I ran back into the house to reload, and when I returned, somebody was pounding on my front door, screaming my name. As I opened the door, it was my neighbor Dave and his wife Carla, and Dave had his shotgun in his hand. He asked me if I was all right and what the hell I was shooting at. And I took them to the back door. Three minutes later, the police were there in force, David having called them about shots being fired. As you would imagine, with the arrival of the police and Dave and I standing there with loaded weapons, it was pretty hairy there for a few minutes until things got sorted out. All of us were now by the back door, which was blown apart, glass and trim work laying everywhere. And we were now looking at all the blood on the doorstep and leading off the concrete patio. I told them of my previous report and about the doorknob rattling on a number of occasions. This night, I told them, when I pulled the blinds down, 
The entire view of my patio was blocked by the body of this monster when I looked up. And his head was higher than my gutter on the back of the house. I told the cops that I nailed this thing with three rounds at less than five feet distance, and it was still able to run. Hitting it again with two more rounds across the backyard. That night, <coughs> everyone and the brother was combing the woods behind my house looking for a body, be it human or otherwise. Nobody, including myself, could believe based on the amount of blood that anything could have gotten very far. And yet nothing was found. My neighbor nailed a piece of plywood over my back door until I was able to have it fixed. And I actually moved into a hotel for a couple of weeks. Looking back on the night, the body of what I believe was a Bigfoot, which I now know it was, was wider than the door and much wider than the door as you looked up at it. I couldn't see any of my six-piece patio set. That's how much glass its body was consuming. When I looked up, my eyes locked onto this evil-looking toothy grin that it was making. And that's when I pulled the trigger. Better him than me. That's what my daddy taught me. What do you think of that? Wow, that was action-packed tonight, Bill. You can't get any freaking crazier than that. No, and I mean... This may sound dumb, but how terrifying is it to be standing in your house and fire three rounds of a three fifty seven magnum through a glass door? Yeah, because now you're you're opening up the door and everything else, you know. Well, well, I'm not even there yet, but I'm thinking yeah. like the noise of that. Yeah. And the glass and wood and everything else flying. Mm -hmm. And then when she said she threw the door open, I was like, man, thank God that thing was running away. Yeah, well, obviously this was not your average bear, Paige Saunders. No, but I mean, I I, uh, I wouldn't take it for granted that even though you shot it three times, that it would be running the other way. Yeah. With that size. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I, wow. I mean, look, man. By the time you're in that, first of all, anybody who lives alone, mm. uh, particularly a female, who decides she's going to have herself a handgun and chooses out of all the nice little handguns laying in the display case a three fifty seven, and is well practiced with it to the tune of her saying she could shoot, shoot a smiley face at a hundred feet, whatever that meant. <laughs> and now she's scared out of her wits, thinking something is about to bust the door in, and she still confronts it. I mean, this is this is like special forces woman here. <laughs> you know, this is this is the chick that you want by your side in a firefight. Yeah, definitely. Oh my god. Rambet. Yeah, Rambet <laughs> instead of Rambo. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that that is uh that's a riveting account, Bill. Whew. Uh, now I can't you know, I had that guy in New Jersey that uh, had cooked up a uh pile of sausages on his barbecue. Came off the deck into the kitchen to grab a tray and some condiments. When he stepped back out the door, that Bigfoot was standing next to his deck behind the, where the uh, barbecue was sitting on the deck. And this thing was like nine feet tall. Ooh. And he freaking dropped everything, ran back in the house, locked the door, I mean, the the fear of, like, I'm a prisoner now, and this thing could come in from anywhere and everywhere at will and get me. 
Yeah. So I'm just thinking, you know, who's to say what you would do, given the same circumstances? But oh, uh, yeah. this lady was not fooling around with this thing, man. Oh, no doubt about that. I mean, she's almost better off that nobody found the body. <laughs> you know, I mean, but blood and who knows? I mean, what could, you can't bring somebody up on charges, maybe for uh, unlawful uh, uh, firing of firearms in a residential yeah, area. Or so, yeah, yeah and, and having blood on your uh, steps. I don't know what yeah. you could do about that, but what a crazy, crazy tale, man. Oh, that is something else, Bill. A wild one, for sure. Yeah. And what about five bullets? Mm. You know, three of them, she says, were at five feet. I mean, that is close range, man. Yeah, and there's no way she missed with any of those three. Not something Based that's blocking the, the door. No, that's what I mean. Yeah. I mean, it took her a few minutes, as she said, to realize she wasn't looking at her furniture. Yeah. That was no, typically I love that description. Yeah. Typically I guess you know with the light on in the back when you looked out the back door there was her I don't know her coffee table or whatever you want yeah, to call well, it that's the how chairs. my back door is now that you mention it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hello. I hope I can see it after we record this podcast <laughs> and I look out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, <laughs> well, you know how it goes, Kev. All right, good account, Bill. How about some listener mail? Absolutely. All right, we got some good ones this week. The first one comes in from Barry. Mm-hmm. And he says, I heard you recently on two three-year-old Sasquatch Chronicles episodes and started to get your books on my Kindle. About to start Volume 8. And the UFO UFO one after that. Uh-huh. So you got a good fan here, Bill. Yep, yep. And speaking of one through seven, books one through seven, they are really well done and absolute page turners. Hope the stories keep coming in and you can keep these going. Mm-hmm. If you don't mind me saying, I can see in some of the some of the stories a book of books in their own right. If you could follow up, say all the stories that involve the authorities, so like uh, police authorities, and can track down what happened after their involvement. Were they all labeled bear attacks, for example? If so, was it approved for a cover-up? Any newspaper articles on these? Comments by family? Coroner's reports? Maybe you can advertise for national parks, police, and other police to tell their stories. That would be a pretty great book. Anyway, all the best. Keep up the great work, Barry. Hmm. Well, uh, Barry, right? Barry. Well, Barry, uh, here's what I say to that. Uh, Maybe you'd like to give me the money. (laughs) Oh, come on. That's great. Listen, he he bought seven books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, the truth be told, Barry, there are not enough hours in the day uh, for me to take care of what I'm currently taking care of. Yeah, but it's a good it's a good idea, Bill. I like yeah. the idea of just going deeper on some of these. You know, mm-hmm. you know, again, it's hard to do both. Having new accounts being published, of course, switch, converting uh, written work into audiobooks. I know how much time you spend on that in a professional studio uh, and getting it into uh, Audible on Amazon and jumping through all their hoops. Um, but it is kind of interesting to do a deep dive on one of the accounts, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it is interesting. And the reality is, if I had uh, enough proof in my hand that there was enough interest in that to make it really viable, uh, I might be more inclined to do something like that. Yeah. Uh, but the proof is in the pudding, which is why I'm always asking people to go out and buy a couple of books. Right. Uh, so we don't have to go down that road. Uh, but, you know, 
you purchasing books, Barry is an individual. Uh, I wish there were more like Barry uh, going out and making that little investment, that little jump. Uh, and perhaps that will happen and maybe things will change and I'll feel differently about it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that's kind of the way it goes. This is no, tremendous. But thank you, Barry, for buying those books and thank you for the kind words and thanks for the ideas, too. Mm-hmm. No, excellent. I'm glad to have Barry on board. 100%. All right, our next email comes in from Beth, and the subject is UFOs in the news. Mm. And she writes, Hi, guys. Love the podcast and enjoy the banter between the two of you. I came across this story, and I thought it may interest the both of you. Hmm. Maybe Kevin would want to do a little more digging. Maybe mm. you all have really already covered it, and my binge listening, I missed it. During mm-hmm. my binge listening, I missed it. Mm-hmm. Either way, thought I'd share it. Hoping you both had a nice holiday. And uh, all the best, Beth. Now, so she connected this link, which I went and I read about it, and I hadn't heard of it before, Bill. So this, uh, the, the storyline is Simpson County creates Captain Thomas Mantell Jr. Day to commemorate the Mantell UFO incident. And now I don't have all the details of this incident off the top of my head, but had you heard of this one, Bill? Uh, possibly if I knew a little bit more right, about well, I'll tell what you it was. A little bit more about it, but don't yeah. ask me too many questions about it. But we yeah, may, yeah. in fact, Beth, do this as an episode. Okay. So apparently, this ge- gentleman, Thomas Mantell, was a pilot, a private pilot, and he saw this UFO. Uh, going back a ways in time. Mm -hmm. And he chased it with his plane, with a small light plane. Mm -hmm. And he ended up crashing his plane into a field. And you remember the Project Blue Book folks, they reported that he was chasing a weather balloon. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, at 150 miles an hour in his Beechcraft Bonanza. Exactly. Come on. So pretty uh, pretty interesting story there, Beth. I had not heard of it, and I do want to look into it. Okay. Yeah, right? it'll make it, yeah, it'll make an interesting uh, uh, investigation, Kev, I'm sure. So why don't we go down that road a little bit? Absolutely. Absolutely. But no, I really now even heard a little bit more about it. I never heard the story. I never heard of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the story is pretty cool. And thank you, Beth, for not only telling us about the story, but including the link, too, because the link has tons of information, including, Bill, a picture of this like uh, memorial stone hmm. with the metal plate on it telling the story of Captain Thomas Mantell. Hmm. So it's pretty, it looks pretty legit. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously there were those who felt strongly enough about it to make this plaque up and the stone, this yeah, memorial. Yeah, I mean, people and stuff. I mean, it's pretty cool. Yeah, probably didn't All like right, the way. So this next one I love. So it comes from Benjamin from Washington State. Okay. One of the places I used to live. And it says, the subject is Odd Things and Krampus Takes Over a Town in Washington. <laughs> Christmas Krampus. Uh. So Benjamin writes, gentlemen, first off, Merry Christmas and happy holidays and happy new year. Mm-hmm. All is well. Bill, I'm praying for you this season with the loss of your wife. I lost my pops a few years back right after Christmas, and it's been tough ever since. I've had a few weird things happen while hunting in my home state of Washington and while hunting in Idaho. I mm-hmm. would love to chat. Mm-hmm. And then he shifts gears and he says, Kevin, I'm sure you've heard of Leavenworth, Washington. I remember you saying that you lived in Spoke Compton. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard of good old Spokey or Spokane called Spoke Compton, but I like it. And in fact, Benjamin, I went camping in Leavenworth. And Bill Leavenworth and the rest of our audience, too. Leavenworth, Washington, it's not where the federal penitentiary is. That's Leavenworth, Kansas. But it's a uh, old, uh, like, German town along a river in, uh, in central Washington. 
Okay. So it's got like the uh, gingerbread on all of the buildings, you know, hand painted like you'd see in the Alps or something. Sure, like sure. That. Yeah. A little, yeah, so a little cool. Bavaria. In Bavaria, yes. There might <laughs> even be a cuckoo clock. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in this town, the last few Christmases, except for this past Christmas, they had a Krampus fest. Hmm. And whoa, did it cause a stir. And Benjamin says, look it up, Krampus Fest, Leavenworth, Washington. Crazy, creepy pics. Hmm. So I did look it up. Mm -hmm. And Bill, when we get done, look it up unless you're afraid of nightmares. <laughs> These guys in like goat suits with goat heads, blood dripping from them, goat horns, walking around in town, scaring oh the Jesus out of little kids. And of course, you know what the goat head represents. Oh, yes. So, but you don't have to know what that represents if you see these pictures. It's clear. Yeah, it's pretty clear. You don't have you to don't think about little, it too much. Uh, you don't need a uh, a key over in the corner of the picture to tell you what different things represent. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, and of course, that's if you're a thinking man or woman. You know. Why? Well, yeah. Why? Well, yeah. Ay, ay, ay. Yeah, so uh, so that's it this week, Bill. I uh -huh. wanted to end it with a little Krampus Fest in Leavenworth, Washington. Yeah. Benjamin, thanks for writing in about that. That was fantastic, and I love the pictures as well. Uh -huh. um, so, everybody, thank you so much for listening. Um, keep giving us those five-star reviews. And, folks, by the way, if you've seen something, say something. Go to our website, BigfootTerrorInTheWoods.com. Hit the contact link. Reach out to me, and I'll reach out to you. And by the way, if you should find yourself walking around in Dexter, Missouri, perhaps in Paige Saunders' old neighborhood, you better remember one thing, my friend. Always carry more gun than you think you're going to need. Sleep tight. <laughs>